are tracing the argument of Paul's letter to Timothy in 1 Timothy, and we are entering the final chapter. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verses 1 and 2 is our topic for the day. To remind you where this fits into the big picture, chapters 5 and 6 of 1 Timothy give instructions as to how Paul is to deal with various particular groupings within the church that he's leading. And today we are here, dealing with advice regarding people, believers, who are slaves. Now, we look back on this and we can be tempted to be very harsh on Paul for not championing the abolition of all slaves. But the brutal reality was that slavery was so entrenched in the Roman Empire that the Christians had no power to campaign for the abolition of the institution. So Paul is doing what he needs to do to guide Timothy about how to pastor people who find themselves in this situation. It doesn't mean he approves of slavery, he's just dealing with it as a pastoral reality. If we look at our passage, which is very short, first there's a generic instruction, let all who are under the yoke as bond servants or slaves regard their masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. And then he gets specific. He focuses in on one particular subgroup of all. So we got all, and then we pick one subgroup, and that subgroup is those who have believing masters. So it's one thing to say I'm a Christian and I'm a slave, but how is this impacted when my owner, my master, is also a brother in Christ? If we unpack the opening exhortation in some detail, we'll see there's an action enjoined of the slaves. They are to regard their own masters as worthy of all honor. In other words, they are to be exemplary in showing honor and respect to their masters. If you're a believer and you find yourself in slavery, Treat your masters with absolute honor. Be exemplary, even though you find yourself in an evil institution. What is the purpose of this? Well, the purpose is the witness of the gospel, so that God's name and the teaching of Christianity may not be reviled. So you as a slave may not be able to confront your master and preach to him, but you can be an example of how the gospel makes even slaves exemplary human beings to the transforming power of the gospel of Christ. If we turn to the specific one, remember this is dealing with those who have believing masters. So what if you are a slave and your master is a believer? Well, Paul gives two alternatives. You can choose between one of two courses of action. One is, you can be disrespectful to them on the grounds that they are believers. You can say, well, we're equal at the cross, created in the image of the same God, and you can be disrespectful and despising of them. Alternatively, you can take the view that my boss, my owner, is a brother, and so I'm going to serve above and beyond. I'm going to go the proverbial extra mile because the one who benefits is a brother, and as a brother is beloved. These are alternative courses, and as you might imagine, Paul is against this one, and he is for this one. He says to them, instead of taking the view that this person is a believer, I can, be, I can take some liberties, I'm going to take the view that I'm going to serve even better because the beneficiary is somebody I love in Christ. Each of those sections has an exhortation and a ground. So the exhortation is, don't be disrespectful. Don't be disrespectful on the ground that they are brothers. In other words, don't argue that the person is a brother. He's not a superior. We are one in Christ, so I don't need to respect and honor them. Rather, the preferred course of action, so a negative and a positive, rather serve all the better, Grounds, since, meaning because those who benefit are believers and are beloved. 
So those are Paul's instructions to Timothy about how to teach slaves to live in a way that is honoring of the gospel, despite the fact that they find themselves in servitude. I hope that helps and makes some sense.